the National Endowment for the Humanities, bringing you the stories that define us. Some of my family and I went to Virginia City to spread awareness of our troubles to any who would be sympathetic. We paraded down the street, and people gathered at the sight of another chief Winnemucca, followed by warriors, his son, and two daughters on horses. My father addressed the crowd, proclaiming our tribe's peaceful intentions, and I translated. We were cheered, and people made donations. After all, there were many in favor of naming Virginia City Winnemucca after my grandfather back when the town was still made of tents. I grew up half in the white man's world, and knew an Indian show was one thing the people of Comstock hadn't seen yet, and they were interested. We ended up in the theater, doing variety shows. We'd play on the new interest in Indians, and do war dances around Confederate soldiers and such. This was about a month before the Union made Nevada a state, to win the Civil War with its silver. An agent told us if we went to San Francisco with him, we'd make plenty of money to settle our people. We went with him, but failed to find any success. Then the agent ran off with our earnings, abandoning us to walk, work, and beg our way back home. During this time, another great tragedy occurred. Many of our men were away on a hunting expedition and returned to find all of the women, children, and elders massacred. It was done by a man named Captain Wells and the Nevada Volunteer Cavalrymen. My mother, sister, and baby brother died that day. This is hard for me to talk about, so I'll just say that after this I left Virginia City to live with my brother Natchez. We had a very hard time not starving that dark, sad winter. In 1866, one of the agents at our reservation sold an Indian man some gunpowder. While headed home, he was shot dead after being seen with it. Our men were wild with this, bent on seeing justice. But it was clear by now that no white men would ever face penalty for killing any of us, though armies were ready to rain down on us at any accusation. So I rushed to the agent's house, coming in the cabin in a panic. I told him what happened and that he must leave. He simply readied his gun and said, Very well, let them come. The attack did come. An urgent letter arrived from Captain Jerome demanding a meeting with me and my brother to know about the attack on our agent and his men. Oh, I can't tell you how nervous I was, trying to make sense of this letter, for I could hardly read or write. Can't you talk on paper? I was asked in panic voices. Yes, yes, but what will I write with? We got a stick and some fish blood, and I replied as best I could that as soon as my brother arrived, we'd hurry to him to speak. We sent the letter ahead, and I waited for my brother, sick to my stomach with fear. When Natchez arrived, we rode all night as fast as we could to the captain and explained and begged him for army protection. This is how my people ended up living at the Army Camp McDermott, where we were at least finally fed, sheltered, and clothed for the first time I can remember. Eventually, Sarah was able to convince her father, with nearly 490 Paiute natives to join the 500 already at Camp McDermott. An agency to relocate the natives was established in eastern Oregon, just north of Nevada. It was run by a Mr. Samuel Parrish, who needed an interpreter. So, at her brother Lee's request, Sarah and her father joined him there in 1875. He told the Paiutes he couldn't do much for them, but provide for them to work for themselves. If they could do so, they'd be supported by the American government for a while. And so Sarah reports the Paiutes being happy these short few years after so many of fear and harassment. With seeds and tools, instruction on how to farm and irrigate and actual teachers in their school building, they at least had the power to better their own lives and had the reward of the fruit of their own labor. Mr. Parrish was sent away though, reportedly because he was not a Christian. His replacement Mr. Reinhardt was another cruel and greedy agent who immediately took the crops they had grown for the winter 
locked him away and said they could buy him back. Of course, they weren't even to be paid in cash, but were paid in portions of their own harvest. The clothes and blankets and other supplies sent to be given to the native people now showed up in a store instead, and the clothes they already owned were sold off their backs to buy food. This type of forced labor and imposed poverty of a people with a different skin color was not a new practice in America after all. It makes the one doing it very rich. And didn't many come west to seek fortune? The Paiute people fell quickly to starvation and dismay under Mr. Reinhardt. When he found out that Sarah tried to report his mismanagement to the soldiers at nearby Camp Harney, she was exiled. She had many visitors from her people begging her to do something to help. Could she ask for help from the soldier fathers at Camp Harney? Or go to Washington, D.C. and report to the big fathers? as the president and his cabinet were known. But she'd been to Camp Harney, and how could she ever afford to travel to Washington? Sarah finally decided to ignore her ban and boldly set off to Malheur. She'd just have to figure out how to get to Washington as she could. She witnessed a meeting of the chiefs there and heard a man named Boyce urging them to join the Snake Indians, or Bannock Indians as they were called because under a chief named Buffalo Horn, they were going to fight while they still had strength, before they were all starved to death. The other chiefs didn't support the idea. Those among them who had been to Sacramento, seen the massive civilization, the steamboats, the cannons, and the machine guns, knew it'd be extermination. Hoyt's left with some 25 or 30 men. Sarah's people gathered up all their money to send her to Washington to speak for them. It was $29.25. This small sum in the hands of one of their sisters represented their best hope against either death or slavery. As a first step to Washington, D.C., Sarah was accompanying a man named Mr. Morton and his daughter Rosie to Idaho for $20. I traveled on. The road was very empty, but we met a man before Camp Lyon who told us the worst Indian war he'd ever seen was going on. The Bannocks were killing everyone, he told us, and the Paiutes didn't side with them, but stood with the soldiers. So the Bannocks would want nothing better than to kill Chief Winnemucca's daughter. I then met Captain Hill at camp. He had with him a scout named Paiute Joe, who had just killed Chief Buffalo Horn, the leader of the rebellion. Having fell off his horse, Joe was left for dead by his party and saw his only chance to escape was to kill the chief. He got behind his horse, placed his gun over the saddle, and shot down the painted chief who was riding down upon him. Joe scrambled back on his horse and made his escape while the Bannocks gathered around their fallen leader. Captain Bernard arrived after and asked if I could accompany him as his guard because for no amount of money could he get anyone to go with him to translate. I said the army could count on me for whatever help you need. He went to Fort McDermott to telegraph General O. O. Howard. If the citizens there don't kill me on sight, I'll be waiting for you at Sheep Ranch, I told him. The next morning, three Indians and a soldier came with a message from Fort McDermott. The Bannocks had killed the stage driver and cut the telegraph wire. There were no communications now between us and Howard's host, and we knew the area was incredibly dangerous. Captain Hill gave me a horse to go meet Captain Bernard. I had to leave Rosie and Mr. Morton there. Rosie cried to see me go. She had come to love me, and Mr. Morton proposed to marry me at Silver City so I could remain with her, but of course I had to send them along. Captain Bernard asked me and four Indian men to find the whereabouts of the Bannocks. Nobody was willing to accompany me on this mission, and there was word my brother Natchez had been killed trying to escape. But when they heard I was resolute to go anyways, they couldn't let me go alone. And so two men from my tribe, John and George, came with me. Captain Bernard told us if we could find the Bannocks and convince my father and his people to return, they would be fed and taken care of, and we'd be paid $500 and so we set off to track the Bannocks. 
about a quarter of a mile from where the stage driver was killed, we found all of the citizen scouts asleep, though they were all getting paid $15 to $25 a day. Remember, all the money that all of my people could gather to get me to Washington was $29.25. That gave us fresh horses thanks to our note from Captain Bernard. We came to a river, and seeing cut hair and smashed beads, knew that we had come to the place where Chief Buffalo Horn had been mourned by the Bannocks. We then left the river, and tracked them for two days through dry, hard land to Juniper Lake. There, we saw something moving. It was people, fleeing. Waving and hollering, I couldn't believe it, but I had found my brother, Lee, who took me up in a big hug. Quick, he said, tie up your hair. In a hushed voice, he told me they were all prisoners of the Bannocks. How dangerous it was there, and that Natchez had escaped three days earlier. I tied my hair in the snake Indian fashion and painted my face. Lee then wrapped me in a blanket to cover my dress. John and George hid their guns and disguised themselves as well and quickly as possible, taking off their shirts. I told him I needed to speak to Father. The Bannocks will kill anyone who comes with messages from the white people. You especially, Sarah. Surely they won't let you see Father, he told me. I said, Dear brother, I am sorry to tell you that I must go to my father, for I have come with a message from General Howard. I must save my father and his people. If I lose my life in trying to do it, and my father's too, that is all right. I have come for you all. Now let us go. We climbed the rocky steep mountain and looked upon the hostile Bannock encampment. Actually, it was a beautiful sight to see hundreds of lodges and Indians down catching horses and preparing beef. We crept down to my father's lodge. He embraced me, tears of relief on our faces, and I addressed those in the tent. You must sneak out tonight. Have all of the women pretend to go wood gathering after dark, then slip out. Meet us at Summit Springs. Whisper the plan amongst yourselves. We then escaped the camp before we could be seen. We found Lee's wife Maddie in the mountains. Father, Maddie, John, George and I headed to wait for everyone at Summit Springs, but Lee went back to help everyone escape. We marched through the night to Summit Springs, and at daybreak, someone finally came from behind, shouting that the Bannocks were on his trail. He said that the last he saw behind him, they were shooting at my brother Lee, and he thought Lee was killed. Father was going to wait and see his people through. If my horse holds out, I can see General Howard tonight. Father, what would you like me to say? My father replied, ask him to send soldiers to protect me and my people. Maddie, now believing her husband dead, rode along with me. We had 75 miles ahead of us with no water. As we rode, we sang aloud, praying to our great father in the spirit land. We came to a small creek where the horses and us could finally drink some water and cool down. We were all about to give out, and the only food we had was a few berries. We got back to Sheep Ranch at about 5.30 p.m. This was the hardest work I ever did for the government. The whole round trip, from 10 o'clock June 13th up to June 15th, was about 223 miles, having been in the saddle night and day. Yes, I went for the government when the officers could not get an Indian man or a white man to go for love or money. I, only an Indian woman, went to save my father and his people. <laughs>